By the end of this video, you will know what the disinhibition hypothesis is and how it may explain some of ketamine's therapeutic effects, at least on the molecular level. Welcome to my channel. My name is Samuel Kohtala, I'm a neuropharmacologist studying the mechanisms of drug action in the brain. In this video, I will discuss ketamine's pharmacology with a particular focus on the disinhibition hypothesis. But before we go into the disinhibition hypothesis, let me take you through a quick introduction to the basic pharmacology of ketamine. This illustration depicts the connection between two neurons. The axon of the upper neuron reaches down and divides into smaller branches. One of those branches gets really close to the dendritic tree propagating from the cell body of the lower neuron and makes a contact in what is called a synapse. The presynaptic part of the synapse belongs to the axon of the upper neuron, while the postsynaptic part belongs to the dendrite of the lower neuron. The principle here is simple. The depolarization of the presynaptic neuron induces the release of neurotransmitters like glutamate to the synaptic cleft. These transmitters may then bind to receptors on the postsynaptic side to transfer the chemical message forward. Glutamate is the most abundant excitatory neurotransmitter in the brain. It binds to a variety of receptors, most importantly the AMPA and NMDA receptors. These receptors also function as ion channels, meaning that the binding of glutamate can open the channels and allow ions to pass through to the postsynaptic neuron. This is where ketamine comes in, since it can enter the ion channel pore of the NMDA receptors and exhibit what is known as a trapping block. This means that ketamine effectively enters the channel pore and gets stuck inside of it like the Ever Given ship recently did in the Suez Canal. As long as the channel is blocked, it cannot pass any cargo and thus it disrupts how neurons operate. This is also how ketamine may disrupt processes like memory formation and high doses ultimately lead to anesthesia and amnesia. But that's just a part of the story. It happens that ketamine's effects can be quite different when given at anesthetic doses or at sub-anesthetic doses. In the treatment of depression, ketamine is most typically given at sub-anesthetic doses, which means that the patients remain conscious and responsive throughout the treatment. Unlike the high anesthetic doses, these sub-anesthetic doses of ketamine may produce completely contrasting effects. Instead of shutting down the nervous system, low doses of ketamine are thought to increase the release of the excitatory neurotransmitter glutamate. Now, all of this might appear intuitively strange. How can the blockade of NMDA receptors lead into the excitation of neurons and an increase in neural activity. But this is exactly what the disinhibition hypothesis aims to explain. This paradoxical effect is related to the localization of the NMDA receptors. Besides excitatory neurons, there are also other types of neurons in the brain. Here, the role of GABAergic interneurons is thought to be particularly important. These neurons can act as kind of brakes of the brain, meaning that their depolarization induces the release of inhibitory neurotransmitters like GABA or gamma aminobutyric acid, resulting in a decrease of the activity of excitatory neurons. Now, the disinhibition hypothesis of ketamine's axon proposes that 
Subanesthetic doses of ketamine preferentially bind to the inhibitory interneurons, thus taking off the brakes from a neural activity. This results in the disinhibition of the presynaptic neuron here in this picture and ultimately induces the increased release of glutamates to the synaptic cleft, resulting in more activation of the postsynaptic synapse and neuron. Since neuronal activity is inherently linked to synaptic plasticity, it means that the burst of glutamate is then thought to trigger other neurotrophic mechanisms, like the release of neurotrophic factors which further influence mechanisms that contribute to the strengthening of the synaptic connection. Indeed, and this is what is thought to happen after subanesthetic doses are given to depressed patients. For example, many studies have shown that chronic stress is closely associated with the pathophysiology of depression. Conversely, animal studies where mice are subjected to chronic stress or exposed to chronic corticosterone or stress hormone treatments have shown that the animals develop depressive-like behaviors that are accompanied by the reduction of dendritic spines in the prefrontal cortex and other regions of the brain. When these mice are treated with subanesthetic doses of ketamine, spine growth and synaptogenesis are facilitated, suggesting that the increased neural activity under ketamine leads to the recovery of at least some of the structural changes induced by chronic stress. This is something that is also suggested to take place in the treatment of depression. So, just to recapitulate, the disinhibition hypothesis aims to explain how subanesthetic doses of ketamine may ultimately produce excitatory outcomes, and how these excitatory outcomes may then trigger, for example, uh, mechanisms of synaptic plasticity and increased release of neurotrophic factors, which then strengthen synapses and also increase the formation of new synapses. Uh, perhaps synapses that have been lost due to the pathogenic process of depression. However, it is also important to emphasize that there are also many other hypotheses uh, aiming to explain ketamine's uh, mechanisms of action. But many of these hypotheses are not mutually exclusive and ultimately they may all uh, contribute to explaining the effects of ketamine on the molecular level. I will talk about some of these other hypotheses in my other videos, so remember to subscribe for future neuropharmacology content. With that being said, thank you for watching and I hope you stick around. <laughs>